All right, welcome everybody. We are very excited today to share the 2022 Fellows Projects, Resources, Tools. These are all amazing tools and resources, and we are so excited that you'll get to use them in your newsrooms after today. The way we are going to do this is each fellow will present uh, and talk a little bit, demo their resource, and then we will take two to three questions depending on time for each fellow. Um, I do wanna get through all of the presentations in the hour we have allotted today. So we're only gonna take two to three questions up front. And then at the end, if we have extra time, I will then take more questions, as many as we can um, while everyone is still here with us today. So we are very excited to welcome you today and we will get started. Uh, Amy, would you like to go first? Sure, thanks Kat and thanks to Randy and all of the folks at RJI for being such great support systems for all of us. And thank you to all the fellows who are here. Um, congratulations to everyone for, for finishing and doing such great work. Um, just a real quick um, intro of me before I uh, share my presentation. So I've been in the journalism world for um, about 25 years now, goodness. Uh, and the first half was spent um, as a journalist, reporter, editor, uh, working in entrepreneurial and legacy newsrooms. Um, and then about 12 years ago, I searched, uh, switched into the journalism support space, uh, worked in academia, um, and then was at the American Press Institute for a number of years before coming here to LENFEST, uh, the LENFEST Institute for Journalism, um, just last year, around the same time that we started the uh, fellowship. Um, and so... Uh, you know, one of the areas that I work a lot in is around leadership and leadership development. And so um, my project is uh, squarely in that, that space. So I'm going to share my screen now. And hopefully y'all can see it. Uh, so I'm very excited to introduce to you the news executive leadership transition guide. Um, the uh, problem definition and the uh, sort of approach that I was um, wanting to take for this project um, is, is actually a good reason. Um, uh, we were we have a good problem right now. We have a number of uh, newer, smaller, independent news organizations that have been growing up over the last several years, uh, particularly as a result of the, um, the Great Recession in 2007-8-9. Um, the oldest of those news organizations are definitely maturing, and many more have been become online uh, since then. Um, and so with those um, changes, uh, we've got shifting demographics, founders who are starting to leave, um, and new leaders who are taking over. And so it's a really great opportunity for us to look at uh, leadership transition and what that can look like going forward. Um, and I think this is actually a really good problem to have because it means that the, the industry is growing um, and we are uh, in a place where we can learn new things and look um, outside to um, other organizations, other industries to learn from them about how leadership transition can take place. So I firmly believe that leadership transition is key to sustainability. One of the things about all of this growth in uh, smaller news organizations is that we want them to be around for a long time. Um, we, uh, many of them are here because other parts of the industry have been failing. And so we really wanna make sure that um, these new organizations uh, continue to exist and to serve their communities because that's what they're there for. So through my uh, research um, and uh, as put, I've put the guide together, there's some key takeaways that I think are really important. And then I'll show you uh, some of the pieces of the guide. Um, so processes and procedures matter. Um, I think we know this, but it's uh, sometimes the boring stuff um, that we don't wanna spend time doing, but then uh, ends, us, ends up biting us in the end. Um, and so one of the things that I took a look at was how other organizations do this work, how um, both inside journalism and outside journalism uh, work on leadership transition. What does that mean? How do they prepare for it? Um, documentation is a really big part of this, um, communication as well, um, and really understanding what's happening um, at the across the enterprise, not just as part of um, the, the day job that you have. So really understanding what's happening across your organization is key to this. There's amazing expertise um, on staffs about um, uh, thinking around equitable workplaces, which I think this, this is an important piece of that puzzle, um, and on your boards as well for those folks who have governing boards. 
This work takes time and attention to do. I know that's hard for folks to think about because they have so many other things they're doing. There's a, a lot of issues around urgency in the news business, but we really have to spend the time to do this work because it's so key to sustainability. Uh, weaving inclusion throughout the process is, is uh, paramount um, and it gets back to sort of tapping into that expertise of staff. Finally, I think it's really important to keep in mind the human side of leadership transition planning. There are folks who um, will be very happy when their leaders leave, and there will be folks who are not so happy when their leaders leave, and there's a lot of emotions that come um, with this kind of transition that you have to be prepared for. So let me take you through a couple uh, pieces of the guide. Um, the first part is about emergency succession planning. It's really the place to start. Um, and uh, my guide has a bunch of different worksheets. You can see an example of them here um, in order to help folks think about uh, what succession planning looks like from an emergency standpoint. Where, does all, where do all our documents live? Where do the keys to everything live? That's part of this process. The second part of the process and the second chapter in my guide is about um, actually developing the leadership team and the executive um, and really thinking through what does it take to, um, to build up the leadership skills and um, uh, amongst a team and also all of the different things that those team members are doing over time. So just as staff need performance uh, evaluation, so do executives and uh, leadership teams. And so there's several different checklists in this part of the guide for folks who want to look into that. The third chapter in my guide is around um, what I've called executive discernment, um, which is really sort of a, a thought process um, of planning and thinking through sort of when someone wants to leave a place and why they might want to leave, um, if they're ready to leave, and then thinking about the transition, um, their own personal transition, as opposed to the organization's transition um, and how they want to leave a place. So again, there's lots of checklists for those of you who like to cross things off a list. Um, this guide is for you. Um, and then finally, um, the last chapter here is really uh, about what's called departure defined succession planning. So what does this mean for the organization? How, um, how is the organization going to move forward in the absence of the leader who is departing? Uh, again, it's replete with uh, checklists, things for governing bodies and staff to think about as someone is leaving and planning for um, what will be new leadership in the organization. Um, the next steps here is that I would love for you all to use the guide um, and share your feedback with me. Um, there are a number of sections that I end up, I will end up adding. I ran out of time. There's so much more to, to mine with this subject. It's something that I'm very passionate about. And if anyone wants to sort of nerd out about leadership transitions of any kind, uh, please reach out to me. This is my email address. Um, and I just thank you for your attention. And uh, I'm so excited to hear about all the other fellows projects as well. Thank you, Amy. Any questions for Amy at this time? Feel free to put them in the doc or in the chat. All right, I'm not seeing any pop up at this time. So next we will- Chad, I actually see one in the q and I don't know if you can see that. Um... Here we go. So there are so many risks and challenges associated with transition, but one of the opportunities is the potential for growth and innovation. How do you build out your process documentation in a way that doesn't hinder that opportunity? That is a great question. Um, I think that um, one of the things about documentation is that you don't just set it and forget it forever. Um, documentation needs to evolve as time goes on. And so it's really important for folks to think about um, talking about and being transparent about the things that they do, whether it's um, the the tasks that they do, the partnerships they have, the external work that they do in order for other folks to know more about what's going on. I actually think that growth and innovation um, can be uh, enhanced if folks have a better understanding about what's happening across their enterprise and not just in their part of the work. Great. All right, any other questions? Feel free to reach out. I'm happy to talk more about it. Thanks. All right. So next we will go to Tazmiha. She created the Muslim Media Toolkit. Tazmiha, feel free to take it away. Thank you, Kat. Um, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, depending on where you are. Uh, 
my country. Um, my name is Tasmiha Khan. I am a freelance journalist. I'm based in Illinois. Um, I am Muslim American, was born and raised here. And um, what really brought me to this project is my experience with the media. Unfortunately, there's a clear media bias that exists. And for example, perpetrators identified as Muslim have qualitatively different media coverage than perpetrators not identified as Muslim. And um, according to the Institute of Social Policy and Understanding, there have been more than 770% of more media coverage of non-Muslims perceived as perpetrators compared to Muslims. And this has re resulted in a lot of negative media bias. So this is where my toolkit comes in. Um, as someone who has reported and edited, I've often been the go-to um, in whatever newsroom that I've worked with to fix um, many of these biases. And I thought, hey, you know, while there might, there have been some toolkits out there, it's, it hasn't been updated. And that's what brings us to the Muslim Media Toolkit. So um, here I will show you the many different aspects of it, um, including how to use the toolkit. There's both do's and do don'ts of the terminologies that we've used. But before that, we also uh, put out a survey for and wanted to see what journalists are thinking about in covering uh, Muslim communities. And based on what we've seen, uh, the top two, two, three things included beat specific story ideas, understanding Muslim beliefs and principles, and understanding how they also approach um, different aspects of the religion. So in order to do that, I think one of the things we wanted to, wanted to learn from journalists is where, which aspects were they feeling uncomfortable um, um, and so we heard from reporters about why it is that they weren't necessarily being um, co covering the aspects that they needed to. And part of it had to do with the fact that they were not necessarily involved with the community and rather cover being very reactionary instead of taking a proactive approach. And so it was interesting to see that. Um, so that's where kind of many of the sections come in for, for this toolkit, which you can click here and see. Um, and also put it on the chat cat if that would help be helpful. Um, one, it's on the dock. Don't worry. Oh, okay, great. Okay, so awesome. And then, um, in, in when it comes to these aspects, um, I think it's also important to know who Muslims are. They come from a wide variety. Um, they're one of the most diverse people in the, in the country because they come from all different backgrounds, including um, African-American, Asian, Arab. Well, there's this common myth that Muslims are Arab. Not all Arabs are Muslims and not all Muslims are Arabs. And so this will really help you to uh, properly report on them, but not necessarily based on just when there's an attack that goes on. Um, next thing that was also important is hearing from Muslims in the community themselves. We reached out to members of the community and at, wanted to ask folks who weren't journalists to see, you know, what did it, what is, what was important to them? Um, and it was important to see that many of them noticed that they were being stigmatized and there's also a lot of Islamophobia that was going on and it's not necessarily, get, get, they're not being covered on everyday matters. For example, um, whether it's just like going to school um, or, you know, having, covering it beyond just the security lens, essentially. Um, Ramadan is coming up and uh, many times you'll see coverage is going up. Ramadan is slated to be uh, next week, um, the 22nd, depending on moon sighting, you'll see that there might be more coverage, but what's happening after that? And that's where community members are important in that uh, aspect. And going back to the toolkit, um, this also there is also a building trust section, which is very critical. Um, and the toolkit kind of shows you how to engage in that. We talk to journalists about how to really maintain that trust and using cultural competency to, as part of it. Other aspects include um, making sure that they're part of uh, the conversation, not just what when you're. Um, reporting on the story, but afterwards as well. So that's that's critical too to do follow ups. And in, in my toolkit, you'll also find templates um, that will show you how to uh, 
could continue continue that relationship to engage Muslims. So for example, here's one about if you want to enter the mosque, right? How, how would you enter the mosque or masjid? Um, and then what would you do when reporting in the mosque? In, in the mosque and then to the some terminologies as well when engaging in your reporting along with how what to do after you're done with the story to make sure that you are still engaging with the community um other than that i also started a newsletter you're welcome to subscribe um it's called media matters and news that represents in the in the past during during the course of my fellowship i've uh covered multiple um journalists, along with student journalist Yasmin Saadi, who I have to give credit to, along with my RJI cohort, and Kat Duncan and Randy, because without their um, support, this project would not be possible. So I encourage you to subscribe and still stay in touch. Um, as mentioned, this tool toolkit is a working document. Um, I welcome your comments, um, because it's by no means comprehensive. We can do a lot more with it. Um, and you're welcome to reach out. Um, so I look forward to collaborating and working with you all in the near future. Great, thank you. Any questions for Tazmiha at this time? Okay, we have one being written. Uh, what is the first step for a newsroom to improve its coverage of the Muslim community? That's a interesting question. I think, um, I, I would first take into account what kind of coverage is already being uh, addressed, right? Are you just covering um, something when there's an attack? And what kind of framing are you using, too? Is there a security lens? Is this coming from a place of victim mentality? Like, empower them in the process, right? Like, there are Muslims are people like everyone else and they're just following a religion and following a certain set of principles and engaging in certain practices that are very much in, in, in accordance with um their lifestyle and everyone it might be different but um not to detract but the thing is i think really assessing how you are engaging in your reporting and also reaching out to community members as well to say, hey, how do you feel about our coverage? Sometimes, you, many times, if you're not even asking your sources what they're feeling towards a certain um, media company, I think that's a place of lost uh, opportunity. Great, okay, next question from Celia. Would love to review and see what can be used in my newsroom. Are there style guide-like entries in this toolkit? Uh, great question, Seal. I haven't added style guide like entries, but there are um, there there is like terminologies that you can use that would really be helpful. And I'm always happy to chat to uh, collaborate further if you think that's something that needs to be developed. Great. Um, so another question. As you mentioned with your previous experience, often the invisible labor of diversity training, falls on the diverse reporters in the newsrooms. How will this guide help them take some of that pressure and workload off of Muslim reporters in the newsroom? Wonderful question, because I'm still facing that, <laughs> even after doing the toolkit edit after sharing it. Um, I think having a very open conversation with your editor or whoever is in charge um, to say, hey, like, you know, while that's great and you feel like the onus is on you to make sure that you're also um bringing on trainings too that it's not necessarily just news specific like being a journalist I think the wonderful thing is we can really parse out information and make it relevant to our work so seek out trainings there's uh, Muslim Arc uh, along with uh, Rethink Media along with um, uh, there the are a couple ones that come to mind that would really be wonderful to do those trainings for your newsrooms um, in a more formal capacity. But when it comes to like individuals, having open conversations is key. Great, thank you, Tazmiha. So now Pleasure. we will move on to our next, uh, our fellowship duo. So Mary and Kelsey uh, will be presenting on the Youth Media Starter Guide. All right, hey everybody, good morning. My name is Kelsey Tolshin Kupfer. And I'm Mary Heisey. And we created the Youth Media Starter Guide. Um, it is a toolkit for public radio stations ready to invest in youth media programs. 
um, and you can access the Youth Media Starter Guide using the bit.ly link in the chat. So we created this guide because journalists come to us all the time asking, how can I start a youth media program at my news organization? How do you find funding? How do you get youth reported stories on air? How do you keep youth safe? How do you make any of this fun? Can I please come pick your brain? So we wanted to create something that addressed all these questions and more and captured our learnings through the years. Awesome, yes. <laughs> um, Kelsey and I have worked on youth media programs at NPR station since 2014. Um, I got my start working on youth programs at WFDD in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. And I helped start a youth media program at KBIA in Columbia, Missouri. And Mary and I met when we both worked at Radioactive Youth Media, which is the teen journalism program at KUOW in Seattle, Washington. So between the two of us, we've got so much experience and we've got experience working with youth media programs with no resources, some resources, and a lot of resources. And we made this guide with all of those situations in mind. This guide has a specific focus on public radio in the United States, because that's our background, but newsrooms of all kinds who want to pass the mic to youth can benefit from this guide. Yeah. So this is the Youth Media Starter Guide. This is what you'll see when you open it up. You can navigate the guide by using the outline on the left-hand side and just pick whatever sections you're interested in. Throughout, throughout the guide, there are checklists, um, testimonials from youth and public media professionals. We have best practices, examples, and activities. Um, so it's our hope that this is an interactive guide for users that you can continue to refer to. So let's go into the different sections. First, we have station buy-in. Um, this section addresses questions like, how do you make the case to leadership that youth media is important and worth the investment? How do you find funding? What do you need to think about when broadcasting youth produced stories and personal stories from copyright to anonymity and more? Our next section is working with youth. It's one of our most robust sections and it addresses questions like, how do you keep youth safe? How can you prioritize equity and accessibility? What can mentorship and family engagement look like? Um, there's lots going on in this section. Working with partners. So one way to find youth who might be interested in your program is by partnering with organizations already working with youth. This section has a checklist for how to approach new partnerships and create a mutual understanding. The implementation section is all about how to make a youth media program happen. Um, we offer like program ideas at different resource levels. We include a bunch of curriculum resources and um, also story examples made by young people. Logistics, very fun section. Um, this is where we include forms like broadcast release forms and code of conducts, things you might not even be thinking of, but you should absolutely have. And we include a little guide on equipment too. And then a resource library. This is a comprehensive bank of resources that we continue to refer to um, from books to websites to podcasts. We hope you find this guide not only useful, but encouraging. And if you know anybody who wants to start involving youth at their news organization, please send them this guide or send them our way. We wanna say thank you to the many people who contributed to, edited and tested this guide, including youth and adults from WNYC's Radio Rookies, KBIA, KUOW, Radioactive Youth Media, and the Joan Gans Cooney Center. Our contact info is on the screen. It's also in the guide. We want you to reach out to us and we're especially interested in hearing from you if uh, you are wanting to start a youth media program at your shop. If you wanna share what challenges you're facing, 
if you want to let us know how you're using the guide, like what's helpful or what you'd like to see in future versions, and if you've got ideas for collaboration or if you want to work with us. Thank you so much and good luck. All right. Thanks, guys. Any questions for Kelsey and Mary at this time? Oh, I see one being written. Okay. It says, I love the section about protecting youth from overexposing their own stories. How do you lead the conversations about online footprint and protecting safety and privacy? That's such a good question. Maybe we can tag team this one, Kelsey. <laughs> Um, yeah, I would say um, for starters, in every workshop, we're really explicit about um, how this story um, will be used. Is it going to be broadcasted? How many people might hear that? Is it going to be on the internet? So what does that really mean, right? Um, that means if people Google your name, um, this story will come up. And um, so we just very explicitly say how the story will be used. And some youth are like, oh, actually I don't want, um, you know, maybe they don't want it to be broadcasted because um, for whatever reason. And those are conversations you can have. Um, yeah, Kelsey, what's coming to mind for you? Yeah, so not only do we have that conversation with our youth producers, but we also encourage them to have that conversation with any youth interviewees who are involved in the story, um, talking to them as part of the interviewing process about like, hey, you know, these quotes from all of us are going to be in this new story heard by hundreds, thousands, maybe even tens of thousands of people, um, and it's going to be on the internet forever. The third thing that we do too is talk with the editorial side of the newsroom, with editors, with the news director about maybe being a little bit more generous in youth produced stories about things like anonymity or partial anonymity, like only using first names, or even retracting stories down the line um, that maybe you're going to have slightly different protocols when it comes to minors in your stories or youth produced stories on that editorial side. Um, and there are sections in the guide that address that, including an example of a time when we retracted a youth produced story. Mm -hmm. One more thing before the next question is, um, I think like when you're first working on a story with a young person and it's really personal, maybe it's an intense story, you can also have that conversation of, you know, what, what is your, you know, goal with telling this story? Do you feel like you're ready to tell this story? Um, some youth might be like, I don't have any stories to tell. I don't know. <laughs> um, and they might feel like they have to mine past traumas. Um, so yeah, just some, some mentorship needs to happen to help them navigate. Okay. Am I ready to, to tell this story? All right. Uh, so next question, if you are starting a new youth program, how do you get buy-in and trust from local, local youth particularly diverse youth who may not realize these opportunities exist. Yeah, have I got a section for you? Um, I would check out the partnership section for sure. Um, one way to find youth is through partnerships with organizations already working with these youth. Um, these are organizations that have adults who are already doing the work of building trust in those communities. Um, my, my computer's lagging a bit, so maybe I'll let Kelsey take it from here. We can still hear you, Mary, if you want to keep going. Okay. No, go for it. Um, let's see. I'm not sure. Actually, I'm not sure what else to add. I guess just doing tons of outreach um, with, like Mary said, partnering with organizations that are already serving youth, figuring out what your shared goals are, maybe what those organizations need that you can provide through a youth media program, um, and just being in the spaces where youth are, like the youth who 
um, may, might most benefit from a program like this. For example, um, if you've got a few high schools in your area and one of them has a, a journalism class and the other one doesn't, then maybe that's a school that you could be partnering with. Yeah. All right, uh, another question. I love the references to equity and accessibility in this guide. These are things that can face a lot of pushback from the top brass and newsrooms. How do you suggest pushing back against the pushback, not only to help these programs happen, but also to demonstrate to the youth how to push back against people who ignore or reject the needs for equity, inclusion, and accessibility? I love this question. I can start. Um, so um, two things. Number one is that in order for a youth media program to do all of the things that it can do, like create a talent pipeline for new staff in your organization, um, broaden your audience, broaden your coverage, increase media literacy across your region, um, to do all of these great things that we know it can do, your program has to be accessible, safe, um, youth have to have a positive experience or it doesn't work. I recently heard, um, I recently had a young person who was in a, a program that I was part of share that she went and participated in a youth media program with a big legacy news organization and had a terrible time and was like, I'll never subscribe to that organization. I, uh, I don't want to be a part of that because it wasn't fun. It wasn't accessible. I felt bad the whole time. Um, so I guess the way that you'd push back against leadership is like, if we're going to invest this money, we have to build a program that is safe and positive and meaningful for youth. Um, you asked about how to model that for youth. One thing that we do in our programs is explicitly teach youth how to self-advocate, especially during the story editing process. So we talk about what does it look like when your editor suggests an edit that you disagree with. And we even practice some of those conversations of, you know, we're all a team. Journalism is a team sport. How can you advocate for yourself as, as a person who's an equal um, in the newsroom, even as a young person. Mary, do you have more? Uh, just really briefly, yeah, I would check out this section on um, station buy-in. Um, there's a section on the benefits of youth media and how it can benefit a news organization. Um, and it also goes into the question of like, um, if if youth media is your organization's only way to address equity or like diversity, maybe reconsider that. <laughs> maybe maybe don't have your youth media program be your only like diversity, um, um, you know, part of your station's work, right? Um, so yeah, I would check out the benefits of youth media section for more. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. Now we will move on to Tara. Uh, she is going to be presenting on her journalism source of safety platform. Hello, everyone. Just give me one second to drop my uh, to drop the website into the chat. Awesome. And I'm going to share with you all today, I just dropped my website, the, the project into the chat. I'm going to be talking about journalism source of safety. But first I wanted to give you a quick intro to me, just a little bit of background. Um, I'm Tara Pixley. I've been working in visual journalism for uh, the better part of 20 years. And I've worked all across newsrooms in uh, kind of local and regional newsrooms in the Southeast. I've also worked in international newsrooms like the New York Times, um, Wall Street Journal, CNN, Newsweek. And yet in that 20 year experience, I realized in 2020 that no one had really spoken to me about my safety or really broached those kinds of conversations, whether as a staff photographer, staff uh, multimedia journalist, or as a freelance journalist. And I had that realization when I actually received some training uh, to go out and cover the racial justice protests in 2020. So as I was thinking about that, 
I realized there are a ton of safety resources available online. There's many trainings that you can take, but those resources are often unwieldy or so expansive that it's hard to know what to focus on, especially in a time crunch. And trainings are also difficult for many to access. They often take place in the UK or New York City, and they're very, very expensive. Most safety trainings are also mostly are primarily available to staff journalists, and all trainings primarily focus on war and conflict reporting, though luckily that is changing in the last few years. So journalism source of safety, JSOS for short, is a response to those particular limitations and spaces of need. It's an online toolkit that offers trauma-informed safety tips, gear lists, and other basic security information for all journalists, including freelancers and students, which are two groups that often get very specifically left out of receiving safety training and information. And JSOS is a globally accessible resource providing a foundation in risk management tools and considerations for journalists with diverse bodies from diverse backgrounds reporting in a variety of everyday environments, not just war and conflict. And also, as an identity aware and equity focused project, it specifically centers the needs and embodiments and lived experiences of historically marginalized journalists. So that's uh, women, non binary, queer and trans journalists of color, Black and Indigenous journalists of color, immigrant and refugee journalists, and folks coming from majority world or global South spaces, also differently abled journalists. So we're thinking about all kinds of people who might have different experiences in these spaces. So I want to share with you all today, and I'll start sharing my screen, this website, which hopefully you are able to access somewhat. And perhaps you can follow along with me if you'd like. Can everyone see that okay? Yep, you're good. Excellent. So this is a, a kind of, as I mentioned, a basic introduction to some key elements that we think will be useful for people to know and understand. Also really important to me was that this website would be keyword searchable so that if you have very little time and you realize you have a question that you can come here and look for something in particular, like I'll search right now for helmet and you'll see that it brings up both um, examples of PPE, what it looks like and how to kind of think about when to put it on. So there are a few different um, briefings across this website. We focused on six that we thought would be really helpful for journalists and working in a lot of different spaces, civil unrest, digital security, first aid, travel, trauma, and disaster. And these are all, again, briefings. So they're, you know, kind of basic information. I'll show civil unrest. And you can see here that we start with top tips. This is the format that the website has across each of its briefing spaces. So we're thinking about assessing the location. What are some things you might want to consider wearing or not wearing? Um, what are some different kinds of uh, things you have to consider about your exposure time? How long are you in different places? Can you work with a partner? And we also offer additional information, uh, you know, linking out to the very many different resources that there are available online. And then we have a gear checklist here, and we have several checklists like this across the website that show you the kinds of examples of what um, kinds of gear that you might want to use for particular situations. Maybe you're working in a disaster reporting environment like an earthquake or hurricane or here with civil unrest. And these checklists you'll be able to um, print out and uh, download print out and take with you if you want to kind of use that as a physical checklist. And then we also did these primers that would give a little bit more information, be a little more visual and folks could print these out as well. And these are in the different spaces. You can see here, this is the PPE primer showing uh, about protective eyewear, the helmets you might wanna wear, um, different um, respiratory protection. And scrolling back up, we have a few other resources here. You can get to the briefings uh, from there as well as from the homepage. And then you can also check out the different primers. I'll click on the CPR primer here and you can see it goes to a PDF download. So if you want to take that with you in your bag, then hopefully that's a useful way to engage that space. And just a couple more things I wanna show. We do have an ongoing um, uh, JSOS survey, which we started during this project. And the purpose of that survey is to understand a little bit more about people's experiences, journalists' experiences, working in the field, working in different uh, reporting environments and how people do or don't have access to journalism safety training and what kinds of things people need to know when they're working as journalists and, and need you know to have a kind of primer briefing on their different reporting environments and the safety considerations there. And the last thing is um, 
another resource that I created is this external resource guide. As I mentioned, there are quite, <laughs> it's an extensive array of resources. There are many wonderful organizations that have been working for some time to create a plethora and all of these databases of information. And so I wanted to acknowledge those and make those keyword searchable as well. So if you're looking for uh, you know, digital security resources specifically, you can kind of go through this uh, database that is uh, many, many pages long, linking out to all of these different resources and find hopefully what you're looking for that is well beyond the primer, the kind of briefings that are available through JSS. All right, thank you so much. I look forward to hearing your questions. Thank you. All right, questions. Uh, so comment on the doc, no questions. This is just amazing. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. I am going to quickly drop the um, the link to the survey, which I forgot to include. And I would love um, if anyone has any feedback, please feel free to use the, the website form, the contact form on the website, or to email us at info at source of safety .org. All right. All we so do much. have a couple questions coming in. Uh, so one. Oh, excellent. Said, how do you protect your mental health? Well, how did how did you protect your mental health uh, while doing the work to create this guide? It's a good question. Thank you. Um, I I felt like working. Oh, and I, I'm sorry. This is really important. I had five wonderful collaborators who helped me produce this work that I could not have done without. They were. Um, offering their expertise on the different briefing areas. And working in a collaborative space like that is I think what made this not only um, a really productive and well-informed project, but something that was really supportive. So all along we're kind of talking through what did we need when we didn't have access to this kind of information and how do we provide that to our colleagues around the world? And how do we also keep kind of checking in about what this experience looks like? So. I, I will say that it wasn't it wasn't particularly traumatic in creating these uh, resources, but definitely having that that um, the support of my wonderful colleagues helped keep us you know on track and and constantly engaging where we were at in terms of making this product. Great. Uh, next question: Do you have any advice for obtaining institutional support? For these types of safety methods, whether it's helping purchase PPE, respecting personal safety boundaries, etc. Yeah, absolutely. Um, this might not be the answer that everyone wants to hear, but in my experience, organizations are typically thinking about their bottom line, right? So for when you need an institution that is very accustomed to thinking about things in one way to reframe and rethink how they are understanding that, if something bad happens to you, if you are forced to go into unsafe situations as a journalist, as a freelancer, then they're actually putting, you know, the news organization is putting themselves at liability and they're looking to expend far more money and resources than if they had just given you the safety resources up front. So, you know, I, I would love for people to respond to saying, hey, this is just the right thing to do. We need to protect our colleagues. We need to take care of our journalists and we need to invest in their safety. That is the thing that everyone should respond to. Unfortunately, we know that that is not always um, the kind of rationale or rhetoric that moves institutions. So I would encourage you to start there, but then also point out that um, your safety is paramount to your being able to do your job. And in the long run, providing safety resources upfront will make them lose less money and less time on the back end. Great. Okay, next question. Do you feel like there's a greater or less interest in safety training right now? I think there's a, a much larger interest in safety training in large part because civil in 2020, we had the most um, instances of civil unrest around the world than we'd ever had previously. So it, it's just this huge uptick in protests and rallies and, and people being in public together in ways that um, put them at odds with uh, federal and local police. And there's also so much happening with climate change. So um, envir environmental disaster is unfortunately also on the rise. So journalists are just in a lot of um, really unsafe situations, just when you're leaving your home to report down the street. And we often used to think about 
safety needs and safety resources as well this this you know journalist is going to war they're going to um this space out there in the world where bad things are happening we have to actually acknowledge that wherever we are as journalists we are unsafe because the world is an increasingly unsafe place so I think that institutions, organizations, and individual journalists are very much starting to recognize that. And there are a lot of great organizations like ACOS, the A Culture of Safety Alliance, um, IWF, the International Women's Media Foundation, and, um, you know, uh, oh gosh, I'm, I'm blanking on a couple different names. So there's many, many organizations that have been doing this work for a while to bring attention to how much journalists need safety resources. And a lot of that work is coming to fruition. I think it's also being funded. IWMF offers uh, safety trainings for women, women and non-binary journalists specifically because that's often a group that is very much left out of safety trainings and the safety trainings that are offered are not considering the particularities of sexual discrimination, harassment, and gender-based violence that journalists uh, experience. So uh, very long answer, yes, I think people are paying a lot more attention to how much we need safety resources and trainings. Great. Okay, next question. This is a great and robust resource. You mentioned traditionally marginalized groups and how you made it a point for this guide to speak to them and their experiences. What can folks take from this guide to make sure these people in these communities are safe within the newsroom as well and not just when going to protests? Are there some ways that newsrooms can transfer the wisdom of this guide and apply it to their own spaces? Wonderful question. Thank you. I, I would love it if you would read through some of the uh, blogs that I published during my tenure as a fellow at RJI. They're all available on the uh, RJI website because I talk a lot more there about the different issues that marginalized, historically marginalized journalists face and how that ties into our safety. As I mentioned, this particular, the JSOS website, it's really a primer. Um, it doesn't get a lot into uh, how do we engage these larger ideas of um, marginalized journalists facing issues within the newsroom. My work as a journalism educator, a journalism scholar, and an advocate within journalism does get a lot into that. So I would love to send you some different um, articles and, and things and projects that I've worked on where we engage those ideas extensively. But I would say that this guide, looking at the trauma section is a good space to start thinking about those things and making the connections between your safety and your mental health and how those things are connected to your, your work in the newsroom specifically. And I'm also working with another organization, uh, Aegis Alliance, which is a group of women and non-binary, mostly uh, POC safety trainers, where we're producing different materials that will address a lot of those things that you're asking about in your question. We're collaborating with ACOS, the, the Culture of Safety Alliance, to create more documents and more kind of acknowledgement around the interconnectedness of journalist safety in the newsroom and in the field or you know, in the reporting environments. Great. Thank you so much. Now we will move on to Ryan, who will be presenting on his Yesio app. Hey, everybody. Uh, hopefully you can hear me. Um, yeah. So hi, everyone. I'm Ryan Restivo, and I am proud to present Yesio as my RGI fellowship project. Um, in my experience, I've really connected with, um, you know, building tools to help people do their jobs better. Um, when I first tried to learn to code many years ago, uh, one of the first things I ever made was a Slack bot and, um, and, and then this kind of connected to eventually doing this, right. And this project's connected a ton of things for me. Um, you know, I wanted to use what I've learned over the years to serve people and, um, and RJI's purpose of building free, accessible, practical innovation, I really fit where I wanted to go. So I really appreciate RJI support in this fellowship and, and to make this for folks. Um, the goal of ESEO is a Slack app, right? To The goal is to reduce the time to come up with that relevant headline, the right keywords to use and give you the right information at the right time to get your work seen and read, right? Um, for reporters, editors, audience engagement teams, or anyone who wants to get their story out there, ISEO will give them the power of seeing every important keyword in their story and getting insights they can act upon. Where today you have to spend time doing keyword research or workshopping headlines amongst your colleagues in a Slack channel. Now you can just input the story into the app, 
get an instant analysis of the most relevant keywords, uh, trends data on those words, and get ideas even from uh, GPT-3 um, to generate strong headlines and descriptions. Um, and it supports uh, language models in English, Spanish, French, and uh, Portuguese right now. Um, you know, yes, it was using the power of natural language processing to help newsrooms generate better, relevant, contextual data for their audiences. Um, you know, in the research right through the fellowship, right, talking with a lot of folks, you know, we know that the headline is the most impactful thing that you as a journalist have the power over to make sure that your work is read. So before you had to think through comparing your story to your headline, you know, YesEO can analyze your story, published or not, and tell you the most relevant keywords that are in it and give you actionable insights. Um, and, and, and it's got a, fun, a bunch of other fun things too, right? Um, and it's as easy as entering a link or pasting text, right? It will do the rest. It'll understand if it's in English, if it's in Spanish, if it's in French, right? If it's, a, it's from a, um, a uh, publisher in, in Quebec, right? It'll understand if it's in French. Um, and then you then pick like where the data should be run. If you're running it in a certain city or a certain US state or a certain country, um, and then pick a time frame right to run that data. So let's say if you were the Philadelphia Inquirer and you were wondering what trends were relevant when um, I think it was about a month ago, right? When Senator John Fetterman checks himself into the hospital, you can run it through SEO and get an analysis on how relevant your keywords are to your headline, um, explore your keywords and get um, get some trends for him in at that moment in time. And um, you can get volumes of searches specific for the Philadelphia market in just a few quick steps. Sometimes SEO could feel like we're trying to write for machines only, but SEO is trying to put the power of machines, natural language processing and AI capabilities in your hands to make your work more relevant. Um, so let's say in this example, right, about the Philadelphia Eagles, there's a little Philly tendency here. Um, but um, so this story, um, I could get headline suggestions from the emerging technology GPT-3. That was something that has, you know, emerged throughout the process of this project and trying to think about practical applications for it, right? So, um, so you can click that green button that says suggest headlines and it will generate five ideas for headlines for your stories. You now, these emerging technologies are great. They give us ways to help that can help us do our jobs better, um, but they are hardly perfect still at the moment, right? So there's something where you could take them and make them fit your publication style. You can fit it into your style guide or anything that you need to find. Um, and so far in the data that I have um, amongst people who have used it so far, I found that over half of all stories have resulted in a Jeep GPT-3 prompt being clicked, right? Newsrooms want to know how AI can help them. And the goal of the SEO is to give them that practical data that they can act upon. They could take those suggestions and they can run with them and they can change them how they need to. Um, if you've ever been in a Slack channel where you've struggled to workshop a headline, right? Um, SEO makes it e as easy as sharing that story, the green share button into the channel. And then you can click the GPT-3 prompt and you could generate those headlines in a channel. And it's as easy as somebody, you know, generating those ideas for you. Um, and then you can talk through what would be best and, um, you know, tell everybody in the channel that you've shared that story and you guys can all dig and collaborate on it. Um, it features a comprehensive app homepage that will continue to have updates, documentation, uh, room for feedback, I'm definitely digging feedback right now, um, and support issues. And um, it'll always update to the latest and greatest code after you install. You don't have to change anything. It'll all be changed. Um, it'll all continue to change and get better. Um, since RGI's purpose is giving uh, free practical tools, you can install it right now by going to yeseo.app, and this is the page that you'll see. Um, and you can see there's add to Slack buttons. They should work perfectly. Um, and you should be able to install it right now into your Slack workspace, depending on your workspace's settings. Um, this is just the beginning of where I'd like to take this. Um, I know there's a bunch of improvements that I'm already looking to make, and there are things that I'm still researching and looking into to build on top of the core experience and um, try to find a ways to make things even better. Um, I'd like to thank RGI and the University of Missouri for their support. Uh, without them, this wouldn't have happened. Um, and if you'd like to learn more, uh, you can visit yeseo.app today. Uh, you can follow me or yeseo on the various social platforms, uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter. Um, and um, I'm so appreciative of everyone who has participated in making my project uh, come to life and, and happen. And I'm uh, looking forward to the future of what this may bring. Great. So we already have a couple questions. Um, the first is, will this be effective for very small news markets? Yes, this is a good question, right? So um, so right now, 
um, the app will use will use um, DMAs, which are like the like so I live in I live in Long Island, New York, right? So the New York City uh, market, it'll use those kinds of markets, but it can also use US states. So um, it can also broaden out to the whole United States or a particular country or a region, right? So we had someone testing in uh, Canada, and they were like, okay, that's great, but like, could I get the region specific to Quebec, right? So we kind of figured out how to narrow that down. So I feel like um, so we'll be, I think we'll be able to get relevant data for uh, where you're trying to look at. And I'm happy to have a conversation if you feel like you didn't. All right, next question. Very neat and thoughtful tool. One of the concerns about GPT generation and SEO is that it may narrow the diversity of expression, which in this case might result in lots of headlines that look the same. What are your recommendations for avoiding that outcome with this and other SEO tools? So, I mean, I could speak to what I've done. Um, I know that um, in tinkering with these models since like December or so, um, I intentionally made the, I intentionally asked for diverse headlines, right? Because my purpose was think about, okay, these are going to be ideas that a newsroom can take and run with. If I can give five ideas, you know, I don't want them all to look exactly the same. So, um, so trying to build a prompt where it said, okay, it'll kind of be a little more diverse. It'll try to take other pieces of the story um, that will lead to probably four of them not being very good, or maybe one of them being terrible. Um, but at least you'll have one that you can take and kind of run with as a kind of a core idea. And then so it'll support five headline ideas right now, and it supports three description ideas. And then there's um, there's a little bit of code in there that does some like subheads. Um, but I'm trying to figure out how to kind of maximize how we can use this tool. So at the end of the day, right, like it's an emerging technology and it can help a lot of folks. Um, and we kind of need to figure out ways to to kind of like help do the jobs that we need to now. All right. Uh, next question. Does it work with articles in Spanish? Yes, it should. Um, I actually just got feedback from um, a newsroom in Argentina that they had some questions about some of the uh, Spanish, uh, trend, I guess, the Spanish model. Um, so I'm going to uh, probably once we're done, take a look at that issue. But um, but it should work with that model. You should be able to enter an article in that slash prep command if it's not published. And it'll be Spanish text and the and the app will understand that it's in Spanish and use and apply the correct model. Similarly, if you have a link, you would input that link and it should understand from reading the text that, hey, this is Spanish. I'm going to apply a Spanish model. I'm going to pull out the Spanish keywords and run them in the Spanish trends. All right. And then uh, last question for now. This is awesome. A lot of the chat GPT type tools are great for generating possibilities, but they don't get the nuance of human experience, needs, and identities. Uh, using the John Fetterman story as an example, there are no shortage of examples of how news outlets have missed the mark with its coverage and framing of his medical needs. What advice do you have for people navigating these waters where they can, where there can be a suggested headline that is SEO friendly, but that might miss the mark in terms of being sensitive towards concerns for diversity, equity, and inclusion? Uh, that's a very good question. I'm trying to even think through how to even answer at this point. Thank you, Patrick. Um, but um, I think, you know, it's it's not easy to figure out these kinds of things. And I know that even with stories that, um, you know, stories that um, where I worked on this, work on this for a very long time, right? Um, I'm just trying to think through other ideas. But like, I know that one of the things that I did over the last few months was worked on this kind of prepared before you publish a story. And, uh, and newsrooms were very adamant about like, well, okay, like we wanted this, but now like, how do you protect my data? Um, so there's a lot of, um, so there's a lot of questions still to kind of be answered. Um, but, um, but I think that the goal of this, right, is to give people the power to make good decisions, right? So people are going to, so people are still always going to be in the middle and in the mix. Um, but we want to try to give people um, a little bit more, a little bit like other ideas, more diverse ideas, so they could figure out how to best position what they need. All right. Thank you so much, Ryan. Uh, we have just a few minutes left, so we are going to move on to Nissa. So Nissa will be presenting her borderless guide to field canvassers. Thank you, Kat. Uh, let me just share my. All right. Great. Yes, thank you, Kat. Uh, I am Nisari. I'm the co-founder and executive director of Borderless Magazine. We're a nonprofit news outlet based in Chicago, and we cover immigration and immigrant communities here. 
We are a fully bilingual English Spanish publication, and we also sometimes publish in other languages like Arabic and Filipino. So from our RJI project, uh, we documented some of our work with field canvassers as an engagement and audience growth tool. Uh, before I go into the playbook we designed as a result of this project, I want to give you a little background on how we use field canvassers and why. So Borderless has always been very rooted in community reporting and uh, being very responsive to the needs of our immigrant readers. And so last year, with the uh, support of the Google News Initiative's North America Innovation Challenge, we were able to experiment with taking community organizing techniques and bringing it into the newsroom. And this was field canvassers in particular. So we hired two Spanish speaking field canvassers to go out in four Chicago neighborhoods and talk to our Spanish speaking community. And so they went out for 12 weeks every weekend. They go to different places. Some of it was uh, scheduled like this, in this case, Angie in the middle is at an uh, art exhibit event in Pilsen in Chicago. Uh, and then sometimes it was just going and standing in front of a train station or going to a food pantry giveaway and talking to people, just spending a lot of time talking to people. So they did uh, very intensive surveys, talked to over hundred people doing surveys. They also gave out our print products, which was a comic book and zines. And they collected uh, phone numbers, emails for newsletter subscriptions. So it was kind of a multi-tiered learning about the needs of our audience, how we better meet them, getting our editorial product out, and then also increasing our subscriptions. This is our other field canvasser, Leslie. She's standing outside of one of our aldermen's offices. Giving out food was part of this, very attractive, of course, getting a donut or free tamale when you do a survey. And this is a, the pin that we had our field canvassers wear when they were out, it means I listened to the voices of immigrants, just making it very clear what our brand was about. And you know, brand awareness, of course, is a, is a big part of this model too. So throughout those 12 weeks, we took a lot of documentation and learnings and iterated on our work and what was working and not working. And uh, we distilled this all into the playbook. So what is in the field canvasser playbook? It's really the steps you need to take as a newsroom to dive into this work. And I think one of the most powerful things about working with field canvassers is it's is something that even a small newsroom with no or little budget can can take on. We uh, are a five person newsroom, five full time staff. We are we are very small. Um, this was a very affordable and easy way for us to do on this work, and I think large newsrooms can also equally benefit. So what you'll find in the guide are um, the steps to start. So you, first you need to determine the scope of the work you want done. Do you want to do surveys? Do you want to hand out things? Do you want uh, to get newsletter signups? Do you want to get story ideas? Is it an editorial engagement marketing? What is the move? Uh, then plan a realistic timeline for the work and having that really boxed is important for you know, meeting your goals. And then deciding where you want the field canvassers to go. We have a list of uh, places and uh, great ideas for brainstorming in, in the guide, but really there are so many and it depends on what the goals uh, of your engagement are that will determine where you're gonna send people. And then how to hire field canvassers. These people are a public basis of your brand. And so it's important to hire the right people. And also if they're dealing with sensitive information like doing surveys or getting people's phone numbers, you wanna be very careful um, that you're doing background checks and making sure you're hiring um, the right people as well. Also the guide helps you decide which locations, events, or organizations you wanna partner with or prioritize. We found that partnering with churches was a good way to, to reach the communities we were trying to. And then find ways uh, for documenting your work and learning is so important to keep learning because every market is gonna be different. So you really need to, to find what works best for you. And then iterating, improving your model as you go, and then of course crossing the finish line. You'll also find practical practical things in the guide, like a sample job description for a field canvasser. 
and a list of things to pack in your field canvassing guide, including links to where to buy them, and then suggestions of where to send your field canvassers. This is just a taste of what's in the guide. And at Borderless, we, we do a lot of trainings with newsrooms and uh, individual journalism affinity groups and journalists. So I'm happy to talk more or do a training in your newsroom about this if you're interested. Feel free to reach out to me at nissa at borderlessmag.org. And I'm excited to talk to you more about this. Thank you. Thank you, Nissa. So we already have a question. Uh, how did you develop the survey questions? Yes, that was actually part of this whole iterative process. So we have done surveys. This is pr probably our third extensive survey with our audience. Um, and we've been around in this form as borderless uh, for a little over three years. So we're doing one about one survey a year. Um, so we had those previous questions to pull on. Um, one of our goals was really to understand how Spanish speakers are consuming media. And so we can meet that, meet that consumption. You know, a lot of people are talking about WhatsApp groups, text message groups uh, for Spanish speakers. We wanted to know if that was right for our market. So a lot of the questions were around that. Um, and so we made a big list of questions, had the canvassers go out, and then we very quickly realized the, there were too many questions. And some of it was a little confusing, um, especially around the demographic uh, questions, because, um, yeah, just with Latinos and race, like, I think there there was, there's just such a multitude of understandings of, of how people identify. And I think our questions were a little confusing around that. So through the work, uh, th through the field canvassers, input, we were able to pare down the questions and reduce them. Um, and that really helped things. Great. Thank you. Any additional questions for Nissa? All right. I am not seeing any pop up. Um, so since we are over time, we will wrap it up. Thank you so much for everyone who attended, who asked questions. Thank you to all our fellows and congratulations on finishing your fellowship. We are also proud of you and excited for these resources to be used by newsrooms. I will email out the link to the Google Doc in this recording. So you guys will have all the information, all of the toolkits and sources, resources, um, and all the questions asked here today. So thank you again for joining us. This was great. We really appreciate your time. And please tell us how it goes using these resources in your newsrooms. We would love to hear how you're using them, um, what can be added, if you need more training, like whatever you guys need, our fellows would love feedback. So please feel free to reach out. I will pass it on or reach out directly to them. We would love to hear from you. So thank you. Have a great rest of your week, everybody. And we will see you again soon.